It's time again for Talk Tracks, the video music channel's exclusive look at the top interviews of the week, plus classics from the past. Talk Tracks, it's the talk of the town. Welcome to Talk Tracks on TV69. I'm Janet Darn. We've got two good interviews for you tonight from two of the most heralded songwriter performers in the music industry. We'll see Krista Berg talking with John Graddick in a recent interview, but before we get to that, we've got a vintage interview from our video vault with VJ Dave Holmes back in our old studios on West Peachtree Street. This interview took place about two years ago with Marshall Crenshaw, an old favorite of ours at the VMC. The first time we talked with him was backstage before his appearance at 688, and the next time we interviewed him was with this interview we're going to see tonight. Marshall Crenshaw returned to Atlanta the following summer to open for Hall & Oates at the Omni, and that's quite a leap from 688. But when you hear his music, we think you'll see what the critics have been raving about. Here's Marshall Crenshaw with his drummer brother Robert and bass player Chris Donato in the background, talking with Dave Holmes on Talk Tracks. Well, hi everybody. Here we are 24 minutes after 8 o'clock on the Dave Show, and as promised, here we have Mr. Marshall Crenshaw, et al. He's got the whole band here with you, uh, with us tonight. Marshall, how Hi, you friends. doing, guy? Hi, Dave. Going to be in town tonight for the big show across, uh, well, across the street and down the way. At the, the big, big, big show, yeah, at the uh, fabulous Agora. We can say Agora, right? Uh, we can say that. I, okay. I don't see any reason why we can't say that. Agora. Agora. And we're going to say it one more time. What have you been up to? The last time you were here on the Video Music Channel, uh, well, gosh, you'd been up to a lot of things. It seemed like even Time Magazine had your picture on the cover of it, you know? They did? Okay, they didn't, but they should have. Let it go on record right now <laughs> saying that they should have had uh, this guy's picture on the cover of Time Magazine last time. Well, yeah. since then, we've been around the country numerous times. Uh, that's about it. No, we've been playing, we've been, you know, working and just playing and uh, pumping the heck out of this. LP and uh, meeting the people, seeing America, and it's been great. I gotta say, that's what we're doing now. Your, your music is some of the most refreshing. I mean, just hey, it's 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 good music. It's happening music, and uh, and I'm not gonna say it's the next coming thing, but when no, people do say that. say that, don't they? They yeah. do say that uh, Marshall Crenshaw. I mean, he is the next thing happening, which may or may not be true. But how do you react to that? Well, I don't know. It's it sort of bugs me. I mean, it's, is 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 it not good enough that we make that we make good music? I mean, do we have to also, you know, make <clears throat> the oceans part and do you know all this other junk? I say I say no. We don't. We well, put out these. We put out the records. That's it. You like them. You buy them. You don't like them. Sail it across the <laughs> horizon, and that's it. By the way, this is my brother Robert, Chris Donato. Let me duck out of the way guys. <laughs> Can we get everybody back here? All so right. anyway, you know, that's it. We put out the records and do the shows, and the rest is on. Uh, well, of course, in some, some markets, it, cer cares? it certainly does help to part the Red Seas, but <laughs> Atlanta doesn't happen to be one of them, for God's sakes. If you can get by a varsity burger, <laughs> that's good enough, I guess. So let's talk about your roots, your roots, so to speak. Here's a guy that we grew up in the same neighborhood, 90 miles away, but you, you grew up... <laughs> some neighborhood. In some neighborhood. Boy, what a big neighborhood. You talk about your neighborhoods. You grew up in Detroit. Now let's, now, let's face it. Detroit is not actually the place to be, you know, breaking the kind of music that, that you guys are doing right now. Uh, when did you first think that you wanted to make pop music your life? Well, I always liked music, you know, from childhood. And, um, well, that's a start. Yeah, I mean, I hate to say that I made the decision then, because it's you know it's not a time in your life when you really know even what a decision is. But uh, I don't know. I, I did develop an interest in in music during during childhood, and I just never really got interested in anything else. Nothing else ever came along that made me say, "Oh, this is better," or "This is more of an out," you know, "This is more better." <laughs> no, I just sort of dug music, and uh, that's that. So, so who are some of the major, the early influences of Marshall Crenshaw? Uh, the MC5, well, Mitch Ryder, the Detroit Well, that's kind of, that's, that's not so, that's not really particularly early. I was already like a real rock and roll fan by the time those guys rolled around. Early influences, well, I always liked electric guitars. Oh, yeah, threw it away. <laughs> I always liked the way, I always liked electric guitar, so I was always really, taken in by stuff that had a lot of guitars on it. And so I guess you'd have to say Rockabilly, Buddy Holly, 
Chuck Berry, Everly Brothers, stuff like that. All the usual ones people always name when they talk about our music. And, you know, it's accurate because we do like that stuff. They've played a large uh, influence on our sound. Also, we like, you know, uh, we like soul music and we like uh, polkas and we like uh, mariachi <laughs> bands. We like everything, you know. We just sort of, we're like sponges. We just soak it all up. And, you know, that's that. Incredible. Oh, Absolutely. yeah. Now, in those early bands, you must have had some great names, right? Those early garage bands. What, what were some of the names that you went through before you finally settled on? Oh, no. I don't have an answer for that. I don't. I don't have any answers for that. I was never in any bands that had cool names. Really? Yeah. Nothing like the Sheffield Fritters no, or unfortunately, uh, no. Ace and the Mechanics or nothing like that. Huh? No, that's a, that's a good question. I'll have to make up some answers for that later that on. That will because I know, yeah. I know on your appearance on American Bandstand, Dick Clark will probably be asking that question. I will. I'll sit down and make up some answers to that one. But right now I don't have one. Sorry. Now you're writing songs for yourself. Uh-huh. You've had a lot of offers, haven't you, to collaborate songs? You know, isn't that the way it goes? Kind of, you know, hey, Marshall, let's write a song and make stuff it like that. Yeah, comes up sometimes. Or, or you just get you just get asked by producers or artists or some, you know, some source or another. Uh, but you know, we hope to have more cover versions of our songs come out. It's fun and and you make money at it too. And uh, we like money. We're in this, we're in this for the money, right? Who's in it for the money? Money, <laughs> yes. Money is honey. Money is honey. <laughs> We're going to go to the, one of those money-making songs right now. What was the name of that? Did you remember the name of that? Um, I forgot. Oh. There She Goes Again with another guy. <laughs> that was it. There She Goes Again. I was at the Keystone in San Francisco, on Broadway in San Francisco. Boy, it's a whole Marshall Crenshaw weekend this weekend. <laughs> well, I appreciate it. So I want to thank you for stopping by the studios tonight. Now, what time is the show tonight? I don't know. Oh. What time is it? 11.30. 11.30, folks. 11.30. So for all you folks that uh, have won your tickets through uh, the Video Music Channel, you need to get out there. For all you folks that haven't, for gosh sakes, go out and see one of the most happening guys in America, as we know it, USA, that's Please right. come. 
Please, come on. Please. See Marshall Crenshaw, his, uh, his brother, that's right. And uh, just the whole group. And Point Chris. And, and Chris. Didn't I say Chris? <laughs> I meant to. Marshall, thank you very much for stopping by the studio tonight. Go have yourself a good dinner. Okay. And uh, the music continues. That's right. And the music continues now on the Video Music Channel. could spend the next 30 seconds telling you we play only the best music. We could tell you we're giving away a lot of prizes. We could let you hear some of Atlanta's best personalities. But none of that would convince you to keep your dial set on AM 1340, WIGO. Nothing we do now could, except this. WIGO. Turn us on, then you'll be convinced. We're Atlanta's best, 1340, WIGO. Hi there, we're back on Talk Tracks. I hope you enjoyed that last interview with Marshall Crenshaw, a classic interview with Dave Holmes. What a knucklehead. Since that interview, Marshall has released another critically acclaimed album called Field Day. And since we've talked with him so often here on the VMC, we'd like to think of him as part of the family. Anyway, our next interview tonight on Talk Tracks comes from Chris DeBerg, who was in town recently to kick off his American tour with a uh, concert at Six Flags. But before we meet Chris, let's take a look at one of his older videos. Here's Don't Pay the Ferryman on Talk Tracks. Great video there from Krista Berg here on TV 69 and Krista Berg live in the studio with us today. Welcome to the Video Music Thank Center. you very much. You were telling me where that was shot. Interesting place for you Americans out there. Tell me it, was, um, it was shot uh, last year, um, right at the beginning of January in an old church where Benedict Arnold was buried. I believe he was uh, uh, an American traitor caught by the British. They're at it again, you see. And uh, it was shot at night in, in the, um, the cemetery, all that don't pay the ferryman stuff are, are on the gravestones. And it started snowing. It was a very weird scene. Mm -hmm. And of course, we had all this smoke and the lights. It was great. I like these kind of horror. You don't get the in a cemetery like that? Not really, because I was brought up in Ireland. Um, my family bought a 12th century castle down in the southeast of the country, and having lived prior to that in Argentina and Africa, we moved there when I was about 12, so for a youngster that age, living in an old castle was unbelievable. It, there were sort of ghosts and poltergeists, things that moved glasses and, and pictures in the middle of the night, mm -hmm. and so on. So I, I don't mind ghosts too much. Mm -hmm. Did you uh, move around a lot as, when you were coming up? Yes. Your um, father and the line of work he was in, uh, the di diplomatic corps. Yeah, he was corps. the diplomatic corps. Uh, yeah, we, we lived in uh, Nigeria and what used to be the Belgian Congo, um, England for a little while, and then Ireland, where I was brought up from the age of around 12 to when I went through university. And then I went to live in England, searching for fame and fortune in the music business. Mm -hmm. You know, that it's almost parallels Thomas Dolby's life. As, you know, he moved around. His dad was an archaeologist, I think. And uh, do you think that contributes when you move around, you don't get to really make friends and have a home to grow up in, that you have this, this need or want to, to reach out to people? And through music, I guess, is about the only outlet to do that internationally. That's an interesting point. I, I have been asked the question uh, in connection with how does it sort of teach you the overview of the world, which it definitely does. There's nothing worse than just a, an insular attitude where you never actually leave the small country you may have been brought up in. But... Um, I was always a bit of a loner, in fact. I don't quite know why. I'm not a lonely person. In fact, I'm a very happy person. But I had a brother, so there was the two of us. And brothers always fight, so <laughs> we had a good punch out with him. But yeah, moving around so much early on must have um, affected me somewhat. But I, uh, I still have yet to find what cerebral damage was caused. <laughs> but it certainly, I, I uh, enjoyed the experience of living in so many countries. Because, like in Africa, going down to one of those marketplaces where it's just unbelievable colors and costumes of the, the beautiful things that the, the African ladies used to wear. And amazing, all that stuff are, you, I, stays in the mind. Musically speaking, I can't tell you what influence, if any, but uh, definitely on a sort of universal standpoint, it was great living in so many places. I suppose communication and, and all those other, ch I don't want to get too deep here before we get into the music thing, but communication in all those other countries, they don't have 
the blessings we have here in America, you know, all the distractions away from just true communication. So I guess you learned a lot about that. Yeah, yeah well, what I find now is that um, I'm sure a lot of people in the States probably are not aware of, of my history elsewhere in the music business. But uh, here in the States, my that video you just saw, Don't Pay the Ferryman, was the first time that I ever had um, a significant hit record in America. And it is actually off my sixth album. So prior to that, I've been playing um, sold out 10,000 seat halls right around Europe and Canada mm -hmm. with platinum and gold albums in a kind of blitz and a flurry all over the place. So in a way, um, it's very satisfying to come here with uh, the success of that song and uh, High on Emotion to present, uh, as it were, a world traveler's view of music for the first time. Um, those two songs really are uh, scratching the surface to my music. I've recorded seven albums. Mm -hmm. And um, as I say, tomorrow night when we play here, it's going to be really interesting to present that kind of rock, European rock, I suppose, to uh, people here in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. Now, Man on the Line, the latest album I heard, was a number one ad for radio and records uh, for AOR stations. Now, when, when you talk about you know, world success and you're just scratching the surface here in America after seven albums, and you put into an album or any piece of work, you know, your, your heart and soul, and you have no label on it, and you release it, and somebody says, well, this is going to be an AOR album. Does that, is that a little discouraging? I mean, is, or, and is radio that fragmented in other countries where you have to channel it all in just one direction? Or? Well, it's always a challenge um, for me when I make an album because I'm painfully aware, or happily aware, of the fact that I have an international audience from Australia, through to Japan, to Scandinavia, to Canada and South America, who are interested in my next piece of plastic or tape, chroma cassette, folks. And that uh, means that when I make the, the album, it's very dangerous, I think, to aim it in any particular direction. And I've heard this expression before when people in England will make uh, a record for England and the English market and they will do an American mix, which sounds ludicrous because if the song is any good and if, if you are confident in the song, you should just give it everything you can to make it as powerful as possible. But um, American radio is interesting because it is the best filtration system in the world of music because um, in Britain you can have a pretty dreadful song being a big hit with a great video. In fact, there was a classic example of that where uh, a, co a comedy team put out a record called nice video shame about the song and of course it was a big hit because it was a great video but uh, in the states with radio it means that uh, uh, to, to be classified as, as uh, for AOR or CHR is a bit puzzling to me because it's a whole science as you know because I believe you were in radio prior to uh, your wonderful debut here on 69 well, you've heard about me huh? oh yes yeah. I know about you but uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it is interesting elsewhere in, in Europe television is far more important than radio I mean, one prime spot on a prime time TV can literally break you, uh, break your name overnight in Europe, especially in Germany and Britain. Okay. Well, let's watch some more. Uh, look, how, let's get high on emotion here with Chris DeBerg, and we'll come back and just talk about what is this guy doing in town tomorrow night and tonight, and uh, talk more about music, video, and uh, fun and frivolity okay. with Chris DeBerg here on TV69. Chris DeBerg here in the studio and there on video here on TV69. High on emotion tomorrow night at Six Flags. Now this is the first date of an American tour. Yes indeed. Um, we're very excited about starting here in Atlanta and we've just finished uh, a major Canadian tour which took us from Newfoundland uh, for television viewers on the left hand side of your map, no right hand side of your map, right across to Vancouver and um, those shows were in those big sports arenas. Um, 10,000 to 15,000 people a night, so it was, it was uh, really exciting stuff, especially with, a, I mean, tunes like High in Emotion are great because everybody's on their seats dancing. And I know that, as I was saying earlier, I'm not that familiar to American audiences, but what I will be presenting is, um, uh, I suppose, a very dramatic, um, there's a lot of depth, I think, in the music and in the lights. What can I say? I'm trying to sell my own show. Come and see the show. It's going to be a great exciting. show. So you use a different band to tour than you do in the studio. Is that yes. because there, is there two separate energies there that you want to get happening? Um, I better be a little careful about what I'm saying because my band could be watching me right <laughs> now. Um, but the fact is, and they will acknowledge it, and a lot of people do, is that studio work 
and live work are two different disciplines. There are people who work in recording studios, session players, who are not that happy playing live, um, whereas it's a very creative medium. And I, my attitude towards making records is really to get the best possible people um, in the world uh, to play on the record. And this is no insult to my guys because they're terrific. I, in fact, I did one record with them, my fifth album. Um, but live, they're incomparable. They're really brilliant players. They're four guys from uh, Toronto, Canada, and one from Los Angeles, and they accompany me on my world tours. They've been with me for seven years, and I, I guess we've played about six or seven hundred shows in that time. The producer of Man on the Line, my current album, is Rupert Hine, who is an artist in his own right and well known as the producer of bands like The Fix, um, Howard Jones, and who else did he do? Saga. Mm -hmm. But uh, he plays a lot of synthesizer stuff, and uh, he pl played a lot of stuff on my album. Mm -hmm. That's great. Now, you had some interesting views on how tough it is here to come up with new ideas and how much tougher you think it may get to come up with new ideas for videos. I yeah, well, thought you might share those with the crowds. As far as like uh, the Don't Pay the Ferryman, the graveyard type scene, and then all of a sudden here comes Thriller, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, I must say one, one great advantage of, um, of television is you can sort of put out ideas and often get reaction back. But I would be interested to know what um, people in Atlanta feel about all the stuff, the video coming at them, because artists who make videos very rarely get that feedback from viewers. You know, what do they particularly like about a video? What would they like to see more of? Although the people like yourself in the industry obviously know a lot more about it. Um, you can judge the videos for quality and sort of um, sound effects and stuff. But the actual, um, the making of a video, now it seems to me that the amount of uh, images and symbolism that you used to be able to use have diminished at an alarming rate. We, yeah, I spoke about Thriller. You can't really do a graveyard scene anymore. Um, you know, the bat out of hell thing. That, that's kind of done, almost like it's, it's a cinema cliche it's, uh, that, that it's gone. And um, I suppose the other thing is, is that working with major feature films that come out every year, like E.T., and uh, I, I'm not actually up on this year's uh, blockbusters here in America, yes. but they will present a new series of symbols and images that will be picked up almost immediately by the people who make um, rock videos. And when they're gone, I just feel it's diminishing all the time, kind of the well of inspiration. So maybe it's going to be back to good old live music. Uh, I, I love to play live, and I'm sure a lot of people enjoy seeing live music, although for a station like 69 who uh, need fresh ideas and videos, you were speaking about computer um, visualization, which may be the next thing. That's exciting to watch, too. Well, of course, I guess it'll put a lot of burdens on, on some of the artists to actually think, too. Wow, I think. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good play to do that. Uh, there's another interesting, now, tomorrow night at Six Flags, live, Krista Berg. Do you have a name for the band, or is it just Krista Berg? They are, well, I call them various things, actually. But the De Berg, yes. <laughs> <laughs> we are D Berg. Okay. Um, no, <laughs> they, they actually, they, um, they make a lot of their own music, and I think they're looking for a recording deal for their own stuff. But uh, yeah, that's sort of a hot shot band, whatever you like, whatever you think of them. Um, Six Flags is an interesting place. I believe there's a fun fair there. Mm -hmm. and it's a theme um, park, a lot of rides. Yeah. We'll have to take you on the mind bender while you're The there. mind bender. I don't think I need Roller that. Roller coaster goes upside After down. The flight that I had yesterday. That's <laughs> I don't think I need that. One more interesting point, we're running out of time, but you have a relative here in Atlanta, and I think it would be interesting to uh, tell that little story there about, was it your mother or your yes. aunt that told you that? Well, I was born in Argentina, and my father's family, they had an estancia, which is like a ranch, and the ranch next door was owned by a family called Dyson. And a boy from that family, Brian, who would be about, I think he was about 14 or 15 years older than I, um, he kind of disappeared into the mists of business. And my mother said I should call him up when, he's in, uh, when I'm in Atlanta because he works with the Coca-Cola Corporation. And uh, so I called him up today. I got a secretary. And I said, what, is that, what exactly does Brian do? She said he's the president of Coca-Cola <laughs> America. I went, what? So that's Another great. big shot from Argentina. So if the rock and roll thing doesn't work out, you know, hey, come back to Atlanta. And yeah, we, you know, I can drink that stuff. That's right. Yeah.
Well, thanks for stopping by. We'll see you tomorrow night, folks, live at Six Flags. And uh, the admission's free with your Six Flags admission. Chris DeBerg and the DeBergs tomorrow night. DeBerg. Come and see us. I think, I, think, I think you'll have a good time. Back to the music on TV69. Thanks. Thank you. All right, that was Chris DeBerg talking with our own John Graddick. I hope you enjoyed that interview. After that interview, he went on to delight the audience at uh, Six Flags and afterwards visited a few of uh, Midtown Atlanta hotspots. And I missed it. Anyway, that's Talk Tracks for this week. Tune in next week. Oh, it's a good interview with Rick Springfield. Thanks for watching.